The first major convincing evidence for the wave nature of light was English scientist Thomas Young's double-slit interference experiment in 1801. Young used some very narrow slits for his experiment. One classic way to make very narrow slits is to paint a small pane of glass black, and then use a sharp razor blade to cut away a line of paint to form a single slit like this one. For double slits, one can get a pair of razor blades, pinch them together to scratch the paint off, so we can get pairs of double slits like those. Thomas Young shone sunlight at a single slit first, and then a set of double slits. If light is made of particles, the light particles will go through here and here. And so on the screen, we would see two bright lines: one here, one there. However, Thomas Young saw evenly spaced bright and dark fringes on the screen like these. This means the light does reach behind the obstacle. We usually see shadows behind obstacles because the light waves have very short, less than one micrometer wavelengths. So normal obstacles are too big for light to diffract around. And that's why Thomas Young had to use very narrow slits to observe the wave properties of light. Because light rays from the sun are parallel rays, the sunlight comes in as plane waves. After the first slit, we get the circular wavelet. When the wavelet hits the double slit, we get two circular wavelets. And these two wavelets interfere to give us these bright and dark fringes on the screen. Here I have two sets of circular wavelets. I'm going to put them side by side to show you their interference pattern. Right now, it is like one slit is here, the other slit is there. As you can see, when the slit distance is much bigger than the wavelength. It is not easy to see a clear pattern, but watch what happens when I move the two slits closer. Now you're starting to see some interference patterns. As the slit distance decreases, the pattern on the screen gets wider, farther apart. Over here, we have black overlapping with black, white overlapping with white. That means the peak overlapping with peak, trough overlapping with trough. So we get a constructive interference. So on the screen, this will give us a bright fringe. Over here, white is overlapping with black. So that means the peak overlapping with trough. We get destructive interference. So this is what gives gives us a dark fringe. If this is the screen, on the screen we would see bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark fringes. If I continue to decrease the distance between the slits, so you can see the pattern on the screen will get even wider, farther apart. In this lesson, I'm not going to show you the double slit interference pattern produced by light. But I have a tuning fork here, and it is 512 hertz. If I strike the tuning fork, both tines will be vibrating, sort of like two waves coming out from the two slits. So I get two circular waves from the two tines, and they will interfere. If you remember this equation, v equals to frequency times lambda. The speed of sound in air is 343. The frequency of this tuning fork is 512 hertz. That means the the wavelength of this sound wave would be 0.67 meters. And the、uh, the distance between the slits. In this case, it is about 1.4 centimeters. So the distance between the slits. Slits will be 0.014 meter, which is much smaller than the wavelength. So it is like the two slits are really close together. So if I keep moving them closer and closer and closer, 
We still get the interference pattern, but uh, they're really wide. So I'm going to have loud sound and a quieter sound, loud and quieter sound, like that. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to strike the tuning fork, and then I'm going to rotate the tuning fork in front of the microphone. And hopefully you can hear the volume variation as I turn the tuning fork. And you should hear the volume changing from louder to softer and then back louder and then softer. Now let's derive some equations we can use to analyze double slit interference. Here we have a set of double slits. The distance between the two slits is d. That's the screen. The screen is a distance l to the slits. And uh, the l is much, much bigger than the distance between the slits d. I did not really draw the D to be much, much smaller than L, so it is easier for us to see those angles and lines in this figure. The Y here is the distance to the center of the screen. Let's say we want to find out whether we get a bright fringe or a dark fringe, a distance Y from the center of the screen. To figure out whether we have a bright fringe, constructive interference, or a dark fringe, destructive interference, we need to look at the light rays from these two slits. This light ray travels to this spot, and this light ray travels to this spot, and uh, this one certainly has a longer distance to travel. Now this extra distance is what we call pass difference. So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out what that pass difference is. If this angle is theta, then this slim angle right here is also theta because uh, we have similar triangles. This right triangle and that right triangle, they are similar. Because uh, this line from the point on the screen to the center between the two slits, this line is perpendicular to that dotted line. And uh, this line to the center of the screen is perpendicular to this line right here. That's why these two angles must be equal because over here we have 90 degrees, 90 degrees. Therefore, the path difference, which is this distance right over here, this is the extra distance this light ray has to travel compared to that light ray. This is the path difference, and the path difference will be the hypotenuse D times sine theta, because this side is opposite to the angle. So the path difference is d times sine theta. When the path difference is a whole number times the wavelength, we get constructive interference. Because if we have two waves over here, and this wave is one whole wave behind the other wave, we will still have peak meeting peak, trough meeting trough, for constructive interference. And so the m can be 0, 1, 2, 3, whole number. And this m is what we call the order number. If d sine theta equals to half numbers times the wavelength, then we are going to have peak meeting trough, and we get destructive interference, which means that on the screen we would see dark fringes. As for the angle over here, we know that the tan theta, which is the opposite divided by the adjacent side. So the tan theta is y over l. But because in the equation we have sine theta, so it would be convenient if we know what sine theta is. Now the sine theta, if the y is much, much smaller than l, which means if the angle is very small, then the hypotenuse and the adjacent side, they would be very similar. That means the sine theta would be almost y over l if the angle is small, which means if y is much, much smaller than l. 
In those cases, we can just say sine theta is almost y over l, which means uh, that will allow us to replace the sine theta with y over l. And when we do examples, you'll see that can often be convenient. Okay. And when I say small angle, I mean probably about 10 degrees or less. The smaller the angle, the better the approximation. The bigger the angle, the worse the approximation. In order for these calculations to work, the phase relationship between the two waves from the two slits has to be fixed. By that I mean, for example, when the peak of the light reaches this slit, the light reaching the other slit has to be a peak as well. Actually, they don't have to both be peaks. They can have a phase difference, but that phase difference has to be a constant, not changing with time. Because of this, we need our light sources to be coherent sources. So for double slit interference, we need coherent sources to produce the interference pattern. And the coherent sources produce waves with the same wavelengths and bear the same phase relationship to each other at all times. An example of coherent source is a laser beam. A laser beam is coherent light source because the light in an entire laser beam has the same phase. However, sunlight or the light from a light bulb are incoherent. That's why in Thomas Young's experiment, he had to make sunlight go through a single slit first. After that single slit, the wavelet would provide a coherent source for the double slits.